Let's talk about the different ways we can categorize computer networks. There's actually a variety of different classifications we can use. Here we're going to talk about three of them. We're going to talk about host roles, we're going to talk about geographic proximity, and then the, we're going to talk about the signaling methods used. Let's first talk about classifying networking according to the host roles. In other words, what do the hosts do in a network? The first one we want to look at is called peer-to-peer. -peer. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, network hosts don't have a specific role that they play. In other words, hosts on a peer-to-peer -peer network both provide network services, and hosts on a peer-to-peer -peer network also consume network services. What exactly does that mean? Well, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, we have a variety of operating systems here, and they fulfill a variety of different roles. For instance, over here, we may have a workstation that has a printer connected to it, and that printer is shared on the network, allowing each of these different hosts to print to that printer. Over here, this host might have a huge hard drive installed, and everyone is allowed to share that hard drive. If they have a huge file they need to save, they can put that huge file down here. Well, in this situation, you have hosts that both provide and consume network services. These two hosts provide a network service. This one provides printing, this one provides storage. And now at the same time, these hosts also consume services. For instance, this host prints to this workstation. This workstation saves files to the hard drive on this workstation. In essence, they function both as a client and as a server at the same time. Now there's a lot of benefits to a peer-to-peer -peer network. First of all, it's very easy to implement. In other words, you could take a whole bunch of Windows XP workstations, for example, and create a peer-to-peer -peer network. You can share printers, share storage. You don't have to go to any trouble to configure this. All you have to do is share your resources. It's very easy to implement. It's also very inexpensive. Now, in this case, with the Windows XP peer-to-peer -peer network, you just install the operating system, and that's it. There's no special software to purchase and implement. Now, there's some drawbacks to a peer-to-peer -peer network. You might be asking, well, if it's so easy to implement and so inexpensive, why don't more companies implement it? Well, there's some key problems with peer-to-peer -peer networks. First of all, a peer-to-peer -peer network is not very scalable, meaning the bigger it gets, the harder it is to manage and the harder it is to keep running. Peer-to-peer -peer networks are very, very difficult to support. That's because they lack centralized control. In other words, there's not one network administrator kind of running the entire show. Every user at every workstation is kind of like their own little network administrator. Let's take an example of how this is a problem. Let's say that you have shared storage over here on this hard drive, and this workstation belongs to Jim. Jim says, boy, you know, there are an awful lot of files on my hard drive. I think I'm going to erase a bunch of files on my hard drive, and I'm going to wipe them out to make some room. What impact does that have on everybody else? Well, Lisa over here might have had her files on that hard drive, and he just wiped them out, and she's screaming, ah, my files. Okay? No centralized control. Further, let's suppose Lisa decides to get back at everybody because Jim over here deleted her files and she takes off the next day from work, leaves her office door locked, and her computer off. Everybody needs to print. Can they print? Nope. They can't. When this host is down, you can't access its printer. Another problem is the fact that when you have a peer-to-peer -peer network, there's no real centralized place to save files. We could have storage on this system, maybe shared storage on this system, maybe even some more storage over here on this system. When it comes time to back up and protect critical company data, you've got to go to each one of these hosts and back up their data. You may not know exactly where folks are saving it. It could be all over the place on the hard drives. Now, we have another classification within the host roles category, and that is a client-server network. In a client-server network, unlike a peer-to-peer -peer network, network hosts have specific roles assigned to them. In a client-server network, you have certain systems, certain hosts that are assigned to be servers. Uh, what does a server do? A server provides network resources. You also, on a client-server network, have clients. Though a client does not provide network services, it consumes network services. 
What does that mean? That means in a client-server network, these client workstations will not have shared storage, will not have shared printers. All those services are provided down here by the server. You might have a humongous hard drive. Maybe we have a printer that is uh, this server manages, etc. Servers provide the resources. Clients simply use those resources. Now, to do that, we have different operating systems implemented. Recall with a peer-to-peer -peer network, everybody had the same operating system. Not so with a client-server network. Client workstations have generic operating systems that provide functionality, such as being able to run applications, do word processing, spreadsheets, etc., and software that allows them to connect to the server, or really connect to the network where the server resides. Examples would be Windows XP, maybe Windows 2000, 2008, Windows 7, or Windows 10 Professional. Those are client workstation operating systems. The server, on the other hand, has special optimized operating systems, and these operating systems aren't designed for client-type tasks, such as word processing or spreadsheets. Although some of them will do it, that's not their main job. For example, server operating systems include NetWare, Linux, Windows 2000, 2003, Server 2003, 2010. These operating systems are designed to provide these network resources. Now the benefit to this type of network is first of all, it's highly scalable. What does that mean? That means it's very easy to expand the size of the network. It's very easy to add more clients. It's very easy to add more servers. Client server networks are also much easier to support. That's because services are centralized. If folks are having a problem accessing their files, well, you know where to look. It's on the server, okay? And you check out the storage on that server. If folks are having trouble printing, you know where to look because the service is provided by the server with the printer connected to it or the printer, print server. Backup is also a lot easier. Instead of having to backup individual workstations, they're saving their data over here in this storage system on the server itself. Now, you're still using your relatively inexpensive client operating systems up here, just like with a peer-to-peer -peer network, such as with Windows XP or Professional. The expense comes down here. These operating systems, for the most part, come relatively expensive. The exception, of course, is Linux. NetWare is relatively expensive. Windows Server 2008 is very expensive. The other thing is this type of network takes a lot of planning beforehand. Now, if it were a peer-to-peer -peer network, you kind of just slap things together, you set up your systems, and away you go. You don't do that with a client-server network. You pre-plan everything. You decide which servers are going to host which services, and you decide where they're going to be placed on the network, etc. So that's how we categorize computer networks by host role. Now, let's look at a different way of categorizing computer networks, and that is geography. The first category is that of a local area network. Now, a local area network resides within a small geographic area. An example of a local area network would be the network inside a particular company's office. It has multiple floors, but these are all connected by a network medium in some way. This comprises a local area network. It could be multiple buildings in fact. You could have this other building over here, several floors, computer systems, and these are all interconnected in some fashion. It's still a local area network because the geography separating the hosts is relatively small. You can even have other buildings over here with their own networks. For instance, a college campus. There's a building here and a building here and you connect all of the networks together and when you do that, by the way, that's called an inter network. However, this is still a LAN, a local area network, because they are geographically close together. Now, it's also possible to have a computer network where the networks and the hosts are very widely distributed geographically. When we have that situation, we're talking about a wide area network. Basically, a wide area network is a group of interconnected LANs, or local area networks, that are separated geographically. For example, Suppose we have a company named Big Corp. Big Corp has an office over here in New York City. They have a local area network. And this company also has an office down here in Austin, Texas. And they also have an office up here in Seattle, Washington. Now, 
Users in these different locations occasionally need to have access to information at these various different sites. To make that possible, we've connected them in some way, and we'll talk about that in another video. So these local area networks are inter-networked together, making a very large inter-network, or a wide area network. Now when you set up a LAN, basically the way it's done is that you make sure the resources the users need are located on the local LAN. For example, if someone needs to open a file here in New York City, you don't want them to have to go clear down here, transverse the wide area network to Austin to open up a file and bring it all the way back here to work on it over here in New York City. Then when you have to save it, you have to go clear across the country again just to save on a server located down here. Instead, you'll locate the information and the resources that each local area network needs here locally. So you set up a server here in New York City with the information that the users here in New York City would need. Likewise, you wouldn't want to store your user accounts over here in Seattle so that someone who needs to log in to the network here in Austin has to go across the WAN link clear over here in Seattle just to authenticate. The benefit of the WAN is that if the situation arises, say a user here needs access to a document that's being worked on by a product team over here in Seattle, they can use the wide area network to get that information and work on it over here. Those are the two different classifications for categorizing networks by their size and their geographic proximity. There's one more categorization I want to talk about here, and that is the type of signaling used by a network. There's basically two types of signaling. There's baseband signaling and broadband signaling. This right here represents our network medium, whether it's a wire or whether it's a piece of fiber optic cable or, or what have you. With baseband signaling, you have one signal at a time on the network medium. And that signal uses the entire network medium, all at the same time. Broadband signaling, on the other hand, divides the network medium into multiple channels. With broadband signaling, you can have multiple signals all being transmitted on the network medium at exactly the same time. One good example of broadband signaling is your cable TV system. If you have cable TV, you have channels 2, 5, 10, 21, 42, 50. You have multiple signals all using the same cable at the same time. An example of a baseband system is the old school landline telephone systems we used to use. Now, some of you may not be old enough to remember those, but you've, you've heard about them or read about them. So. Now, telephone systems are starting to use broadband signaling, allowing you to use DSL and your telephone systems at the same time. But in the old days, telephones used to use baseband signaling. In other words, you picked up the telephone receiver and you made a telephone call. Well, while you were using the phone, someone else on a different extension in the same house could not lift up the phone and make a phone call at the same time, right? Because you could only have one signal on the wire at a time. So those are the two types of signaling categorizations used to define computer networks. Make sure and check out our free course if you haven't, and I'll see you there.